Hi everyone, my name is Mr Barlow. Welcome to episode 34 of the VCE Biology Podcast. This episode covers part of Unit 4, Area of Study 1, and I'll be talking about the way that genes work, including their transcription and translation, as well as the way that some genes can be regulated. So DNA is an information-carrying molecule, and the information is stored in little bits of the DNA called genes. But for that information in the genes to be used by the cell, two processes have to take place. So they're called transcription and translation. So very briefly, in transcription, the instructions which are encoded on the DNA are transcribed into another molecule which is called RNA, and in translation, those instructions which are now on the RNA are in fact translated into a protein built of amino acids. So DNA is made of nucleotides and it has instructions and then those instructions are transcribed onto RNA and then those instructions are translated into a protein and the protein then does its job within the cell. So in transcription the genetic instructions are copied from DNA onto RNA. And while both DNA and RNA are examples of nucleic acids, they're actually a little bit different, very similar, a little bit different though. So the the biggest difference is, of course, that DNA has got four bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. RNA has four bases too, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil. So RNA has got a base called uracil instead of thymine, and its abbreviation is U instead of T. Um, DNA has got a sugar called deoxyribose, whereas RNA has got a sugar called ribose, so that's why it's called DNA, deoxyribose, and RNA is called RNA, ribo, nucleic acid. Um, DNA comes as a double-stranded helix, whereas RNA is uh, normally just a single-stranded chain, so there are some differences. So although there are some differences between DNA and RNA, they're certainly similar enough so that um, the information in DNA can be accurately copied into RNA during transcription. So what happens is the DNA molecule acts as a template for the uh, messenger RNA transcript, and they're complementary. So whatever's on the DNA, the mRNA is complementary to that. So if the DNA sequence was C, T, G, A, the mRNA transcript would be G, A, C, U. So C is complementary to G, T is complementary to A, G is complementary to C, and A is complementary to U on the mRNA. Now, as DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell, transcription obviously happens in the nucleus of the cell. So what happens is a special enzyme called RNA polymerase binds to a specific area of the DNA, and it's called the promoter region of the DNA, So once the RNA polymerase, and in fact some other transcription factors, have bound to the promoter region of the DNA, that RNA polymerase zips along uh, one single strand of the DNA molecule so that it can create or transcribe a single strand of messenger RNA. So in fact DNA is, is a double helix, but messenger RNA is only a single strand. So only one strand of DNA serves as the template for the messenger RNA, and that strand is called the antisense strand. The other strand of DNA which does not get transcribed is called the sense strand. So the RNA polymerase zips along the DNA molecule and an ever-growing strand of messenger RNA is created as A's, C's, G's and U's are added to the mRNA which are of course complementary to the A's, C, G's and T's of the DNA. So when the RNA polymerase reaches a region of the DNA called the terminator sequence, it stops making uh, messenger RNA and it releases the messenger RNA molecule just into the nucleus and then the RNA polymerase enzyme itself detaches from the DNA. Now in fact the primary product of translation is called pre-mRNA or pre-messenger RNA. That's also known as the primary transcript. So the sequence of nucleotides in a molecule of pre-mRNA are precisely complementary to every single one of the nucleotides in the uh, gene or the DNA molecule which was transcribed. 
but the pre-mRNA molecule is actually altered um, before it goes a bit further. So it gets altered in a process known as post-transcriptional modification. And in post-transcriptional modification, RNA splicing occurs, and this is a process by which introns, or the regions of RNA that don't code for a protein, are removed from the pre-mRNA, and the remaining exons are connected or reconnected to reform a single continuous uh, mRNA molecule. Now once transcription has finished, the next step in gene function is known as translation. And this is where the instructions which are now on the mRNA molecule are used to create a protein. Translation actually happens in the cytoplasm um, because that is where the ribosomes are located and translation happens uh, on ribosomes. So the messenger RNA leaves the nucleus via nuclear pore. Uh, it then joins onto a ribosome where it sits with its, with its instructions ready to make a protein. Now, if you recall, proteins are actually polymers of amino acids. So to make a protein, we need to have each amino acid arrive one by one onto the mRNA ribosomal complex so that you know, the polypeptide chain can be made. And what actually happens here is there's these special carrier molecules called transfer RNAs and specific amino acids are carried by specific tRNAs. And tRNAs have got something on them called an anticodon. And an anticodon connects with the messenger RNAs matching codon. So they're those triplet or three base pair codes on the messenger RNA. And a three base pair code codes for one protein because a codon on the mRNA is complementary to an anticodon on a tRNA. And the tRNA brings each amino acid to the ribosome so that a protein can be made. So the production of proteins actually begins at a special spot on the mRNA called a start codon. And a start codon is the um, nucleotides A, U, G. And then every three nucleotides after that, or every codon after that, a tRNA comes in with its anticodon, brings in the special or the specific amino acid, and this slowly joins on to form a chain of amino acids or protein. And when the protein is made, what happens is um, we get to a stop codon on the mRNA. And stop codons are one of three codons. They're either UAA, UAG, or UGA. So we start with a start codon. Translation then occurs to make a protein. And then we hit a stop codon so that our um, protein is then finished. And then the protein you know, goes off into the cytoplasm and some folding occurs um, so that it becomes a, a, a functional protein. Now, all living things are, have DNA, so you won't be surprised to hear that in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, transcription of mRNA from a DNA molecule occurs, and then translation to make proteins from the mRNA occurs. Interestingly, however, because prokaryotes don't have a membrane-bound nucleus, once the mRNA is transcribed, it can be translated into a protein virtually immediately. And this is because in prokaryotes, the messenger RNA doesn't have to leave the nucleus to be uh, translated. It can happen, you know, basically straight away. So protein uh, creation or, you know, gene action can actually happen a little bit faster in prokaryotes. So I've just talked about transcription and translation. So in other words, the kind of general rule that genes encode for proteins. But in fact, genes don't always make proteins. Sometimes to function, a gene just encodes or just uh, transcribes some RNA. A good example of this is, of course, transfer RNA, which we've just talked about. So some genes encode for transfer RNAs, and there's lots of different transfer RNAs to bring in the amino acids in translation. So, you know, we need to have transfer RNA. Some genes also encode for ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, which makes up ribosomes. So while most of the time for a gene to function, transcription and translation creates a protein, sometimes for a gene to function, just, the gene is just transcribed to produce some RNA. So by looking at the enormous complexity of the human body, as one would expect, genes have a wide variety of various functions. 
Some genes produce proteins that become part of the structure and the functioning of the organism. So a gene that helps an organism function would be a gene that encodes for an enzyme. Uh, a gene that uh, contributes to the structure of an organism might be, for example, keratin. Keratin is a protein which is found in your hair and your nails or collagen. Collagen is a protein which is found in your connective tissue like your cartilage. And so genes that um, contribute to the structure or the functioning of an organism are called structural genes. So another type of gene is a regulator gene. So regulator genes are involved in controlling the expression of one or more other genes. So you know, they regulate gene expression in other genes. And they can do this by producing a DNA binding protein or you know, transcribing and translating to make a DNA binding protein. And that protein can then bind to or near to a gene which is it's trying to control. So it can it binds near to a gene and that'll either increase the gene's expression or it could decrease the gene's expression. Uh, regular genes could also create signaling proteins, and these can bind to receptors on cell membranes and control gene action. So there's you know structural genes, but there's also regulator genes. <laughs> Another class of gene which shows the enormous um, variety in gene function is homeotic genes. So homeotic genes are genes involved in developmental patterns and sequences. So, you know, embryonic development, so when, when an organism is first growing. For example, homeotic genes are involved in determining where, when and how body segments develop in flies, but you know, how body parts develop in you know, people and all sorts of organisms. Um, but for example, alternations in genes in flies can cause changes in the patterns of the body parts that can cause um, legs grow in place of antenna on flies or the flies can grow an extra set of wings. So homeotic genes are uh, you know, vitally important to ensure normal development. And um, you, you certainly don't want to have any mutations in your homeotic genes. So DNA is just an amazing molecule. It carries all of the genes which encode for just an enormous array of functions within the body. So importantly, every time a cell replicates, the DNA in the first cell, in the parent cell, has to go to the daughter cells. It has to you know, go into the new cells to help that cell function. So DNA, really importantly, is self-replicating and it replicates before a cell divides so that exact copies of the DNA can go into each of the two new cells. Now DNA replication is controlled by an enzyme called DNA polymerase and importantly a double-stranded DNA molecule produces, as you'd expect, two identical double-stranded DNA molecules and each of the new DNA molecules contain one of the old strands from the parent cell and a newly generated or newly synthesized strand. Interestingly, um, DNA replication happens lightning fast, really, if you ask me. So we've got three billion base pairs of um, nucleotides of DNA in every single cell in our bodies. And DNA is replicated in our cells at about 50 nucleotides per second. So I reckon that's really fast. But in prokaryotes, DNA replication actually occurs at about 1,000 nucleotides per second. So DNA replication is, is vital to ensure that all cells have the right uh, information, the right instructions to uh, control the cell. It actually happens really fast, especially in prokaryotes. So DNA is a truly amazing molecule. It encodes all of the information for all of the genes in an organism. And normally, genes are transcribed to form mRNA, which is then translated to form a protein. But of course, sometimes genes just make RNA, for example, tRNA or rRNA. And in fact, there are a whole bunch of different types of genes. There's structural genes, regulator genes, homeotic genes. In fact, one gene can actually have different functions, one single gene. One gene can do different things, uh, and that depends on whether or not uh, all of the introns or some of the introns, or in fact, some of the exons are spliced out of the uh, messenger RNA when um, post-transcriptional modification occurs. And just to complicate things even more, not all genes are active throughout an entire organism's life. Some genes are only active during a short period of time. For example, um, if, you're, if you're unfortunate enough to have Alzheimer's or Huntington's genes, those only become active later in life. Um, some genes are active the whole time, like the genes involved in cellular respiration. And again, just to complicate things, some genes are only active in some tissue, so not all genes are active in all tissue. Uh, for example, um, 
you know, the genes that are active in your skin cells are going to be very different from the genes which are active in your bone cells or your muscle cells. So gene expression is different between cells of different tissues. It's different between cells of the same tissue, possibly, but at different stages of development. It's different between normal and abnormal cells, such as cancerous cells. It's different between cells under different environmental conditions, such as cells exposed to chemical pollutants or drugs, you know, or in plants, cells exposed to light or not exposed to light. Uh, so gene expression can be vastly different. So you can imagine with, you know, tens of thousands of genes all having different functions in different times and places all over the place, it must be enormously difficult to study that kind of thing for researchers. But fortunately, we've developed a technology uh, called microarray technology, and this enables researchers to study the total gene expression of a cell by having an organism's entire genome printed onto a, a little microscope slide. So what you can do is you can look at a group of cells which come from diseased tissue and a group of cells which come from normal tissue and see the different ways that genes are expressed in both of those tissues. So if you see that um, in the diseased tissue there's a bunch of genes which are far more strongly expressed than in a normal tissue, that might give you some sort of indication that those genes are you know, the diseased genes. So you not, might be able to find or discover some diseased genes by using microarray micro technology. Another type of technology involving uh, genes is the ability to switch genes off. And this is called RNA interference. Um, the way it works is you, you get a double-stranded uh, piece of RNA or dsRNA and add it to some cells. That double-stranded DNA is then cut into smaller fragments which are called small interfering RNA or siRNA. These siRNA molecules then actually combine with particular proteins to form an nRNA-induced silencing complex or a risk. So you put double-stranded DNA into a cell and then a risk complex forms. And that risk complex works to break down specific messenger RNA molecules. So the specificity comes in because the siRNA has to be the complementary base sequence to the particular messenger RNA. So a risk complex can, can stop messenger RNA, you know, can degrade messenger RNA. So if you can degrade a specific piece of messenger RNA, which has been um, transcribed by a specific gene, you've basically, what you're doing is you're silencing that gene. So you stop that gene, um, you're stopping the messenger RNA of that gene becoming a protein, so the effects of that gene uh, don't happen in the cell anymore. So it's, you know, it's gene silencing. And it's got a great deal of potential, this you know, RNA interference. Um, for example, if we could figure out a way to get it to turn off dominant disease-causing genes, we could basically get rid of some diseases. Uh, so it's a fantastic uh, potential technology. And that brings episode 34 of the VCE Biology podcast to a close. I'm Mr Barlow, and thanks for listening. <laughs>